to the Naseba, trying to crash through and did well. That is hard for Seba Naseba. The strength of the man exhibited there. Seba Naseba, good forward. Well, Petro Sivanasiva, welcome to Grand Final Week and at a very special time of year for all of the game's greatest players. What makes the last seven days of the season life-changing? I think it's what you endure in the season, you know, when you start from pre-season the year before um, and then just that roller coaster ride, you know, trying to be consistent through the year to put yourself... Uh, to give yourself an opportunity to, to be in finals contention. So I think that journey in itself um, is, is uh, one that, you know, obviously uh, you, you have to share with your team and then to get there to the, to the, big, uh, the big week is, um, is amazing. What is it like to experience as a young player and even as a, a more experienced player, the, the, the festivities, uh, the pomp and pageantry that goes along with all the big events leading up to the decider on the Sunday? But uh, as a player, how do you navigate all that? Because there's so many pressures and mm. questions and nerves and excitement. What was your best <laughs> moments of Grand Final Week? In my first year of uh, NRL playing in the NRL, um, you know, playing for the Broncos uh, in that 98 Grand Final. And I think being a young player, I think you, you take things for granted uh, somewhat because it just comes on so quick. Um, definitely the hype, um, the media tension around it, uh, and obviously playing for the Broncos, uh, being a one-team town, um, you can just feel that excitement um, and obviously that nervousness that comes with it as well too. So you try and get through the week as best as possible. And then, you know, uh, in comparison to, you know, 2006, where I was at the end of my career, um, I think we we're a lot more relaxed and uh, in, in, in how to, to take on the week. But um, nonetheless, you're still excited about the great opportunity that lies ahead. For the Brisbane Broncos, they've restored this enormous juggernaut that they are uh, back on top of mm. the of the game and, and the way that they've gone through this season with athletic display and explosive attack and united defence, the way that they've reinvented themselves, how proud have you been of their journey? Yeah, it's been amazing to watch. I think uh, just that consistency that they've been playing with all year and, you know, you can't discount, you know, those the, the great leadership, you know, um, Kurt Capewell, Adam Reynolds have just been enormous for this Broncos team. We've got great young leaders, but again, to have uh, them being a part of, of this young group um, has taken them to another level. I think the most pleasing aspect too is defensively, they've just been so strong. So we know that they can score points, but um, you know it'll be one on the back of their defence. Tell me about the young men in this pack. This must be something that you can stand back and applaud. Payne Haas, one of the leading props in the game, if not the best we've mm. seen. Pat Carrigan, Jordan Ricky putting the platform out there so that this electrifying backline can go to work. What do you appreciate most about this forward pack? Everyone steps up to the plate in terms of, you know, the go forward um, defensively, they're so strong through the middle. Um, but yeah, I think it's that level of maturity now that they're, they're starting to show. You could see that as young players, you know, in years uh, gone by that, you know, they had what it took, but it was just a matter of just believing in themselves and obviously now starting to play the consistent footy. But in terms of being a forward pack, I mean, uh, you know, you can compare them to some of the great forward packs of, of Broncos teams in years gone by because uh, just the way they play, the physicality, um, and you know, uh, I, I think as a group um, they're going to mature into you know again a, a real powerhouse uh, for the Broncos in many more years to come. Does Payne Haas remind you of a young Petro? <laughs> no, uh, he's uh, he's a lot better than a young Petro. I've got to admit. Um, Look, I think, you know, we've been blessed at the Broncos with uh, so many wonderful front rowers, um, Shane Webke, Andrew G, Glenn Lazarus, of course. But, yeah, Payne and what he's been able to accomplish in his career so far, being such a young age too, I think uh, it's just going to be so exciting to, to, to watch his career unfold. What about these young Panthers, these modern-day champions angling for a three-peat? What's so special about this exciting playing group? Yeah, I, I think the, the fact that, you know, their journey in rugby league has, has been shared together, you know, from a young age, um, you know, and it's been well documented, you know, from, you know, playing Panthers juniors together, the majority of those boys. And I think, you know, they've got just, just a, a unique bond, which is why they, you know, won the, the title a couple of times now and uh, possibly going for a third title. It's it's really exciting to see, sort of see that, again, being a young group, that they've achieved so much. So. Uh, they're going to take some stopping. There's a wonderful sense of belief in that group. Um, and as, as I said, they've achieved so much and uh, they wouldn't look out of place holding the trophy aloft again. What makes that footprint so strong and so powerful? And as you mentioned, the 
the inherited knowledge that they have coming through the juniors together when you've lived out in Western <laughs> Sydney. It's, it's a different and it's a very unique place and a very united community and mm. they, they stick together pretty well um, and, and they love that they're Panthers. It's, you know, us versus them. They've got that real mentality. What makes rugby league such a prized possession there? Yeah, it's just a proud community. You know, they uh, the players love representing their community. It's probably one thing that I noticed when I first moved to Penrith was um, just uh, the sheer numbers of, of juniors that they had, um, the strength of their junior development program and, um, you know, uh, just the way they, they nurture the, their young talent through their different levels of their junior development systems and then getting into, into senior grade. So it's, to me, no surprise, you know, really. Um, I think the fact that they've had so much success with such a young group and um, scary to think, you know, there's there's junior Panthers coming on through that um, will similarly, you know, take take over from where these guys leave off. 1998, grand final day. Your pack, you've got Webb Kitalis, Andrew mm. G, Brad Thorne, Kevin Campion. You're coming in off the bench. It, it's an incredible group mm. and an incredible time for the club. The egos, the characters, the personalities, <laughs> that's probably one of the best groups that we've ever seen in the NRL era. What was that experience? Pretty surreal, to be honest. I mean, I, I'd worked um, in the lower grades for a few years coming from Redcliffe and uh, you know what it was almost like uh, at one point I, th I thought you know Wayne might give me an opportunity because I'd spent a couple of years in the lower grades but uh, thankfully I think Cyril Connell uh, he was our uh, recruiter there at the Broncos and recruited so many of the great uh, Bronco champions um, believed in me and I uh, said to Wayne you know just give him give him uh, one more chance you know so I was lucky that 98 season um, you know did enough in reserve grade to, to get a chance and yeah, walk in the dressing room for the first time and, you know, as you said, the, the, the absolute champions. These are guys that I idolised, you know, clicked with their autographs a few years before and then all of a sudden sitting in the dressing room alongside them. So it was an amazing journey that first year, um, you know, just being around, you know, Kevy and Alf, the way they led that side and then, you know, to, to go all the way through the finals and then to, to, to make that grand final appearance on the bench was uh, was amazing. And I'll never forget, um, you know, walking around Sydney Football Stadium um, with my heroes, really, um, you know, as, as, a, as an NRL champion. For you, who took you under their wing? Who taught you to be professional? Mm, I was really fortunate. Uh, sort of front row play wasn't new to me in that um, I was uh, played, you know, in the centres, uh, played a bit of second row and then uh, I guess it was Wayne that broke the news to me that we're going to give you a shot in the front row. So I was in the perfect spot at the Broncos with the likes of Andrew G and Shane Webke. We had an amazing forward pack and, um, you know, I think at that time too, you, you got an understanding of what it would take to, to wear a Broncos jersey, their work ethic, uh, the way they trained, um, it, the, it was very physical. Often uh, a fair bit of blood was spilt, you know, on the training paddock. But for me, it was a bit of an initiation. You had to earn their respect if you were going to play in their forward pack. So um, it was a real big learning curve for me. But um, it's one that, you know, I think, you know, gave me the foundations to, you know, to, to reach the heights in, in footy. A couple of years later, Broncos would be there again for the decider, but you were injured. How tough was that to cope? Yeah, it was tough. Um, you know, things were looking great for me. Um, there was a bit of ban banter around, you know, possibly, you know, debuting for Origin. Um, and then unfortunately, halfway through the year, broke my arm. Um, and um, it was the second time I'd, I'd broken it. So needed surgery, had a plate put in. So it was a tough few months there watching the boys, but obviously immensely proud. And, um, you know, to see uh, Kevy and the boys um, lift up that trophy in 2000 was very special. Do you remember how you broke it? Yeah, it was actually on someone's head, I think. So uh, I'd like to say they headbutted my arm, or maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But uh, yeah, it was uh, unfortunate. Um, broke it the year before, um, and against the Warriors, uh, I think Monty Beetham might have been a part of that. And then uh, broke it again in uh, in Melbourne. So where does 2006 then sit for you? How special is that? Yeah, it was an amazing year, especially the fact that I was, you know, coming towards the end of uh, my career. Um, I, uh, I'd been picked to play State of Origin earlier in that year and there was a fair bit of discussion around myself and Steve Price and Darren Lockyer. Um, you know, we'd, we'd seen a few losses, um, consecutive losses, uh, and there were some question marks about us playing rep football, you know. Um, and so, um, you know, I think uh, the fact that, you know, we had such a great young team coming through, um, we are able to win that series and I guess that started that run. So from that point on and then, you know, finishing the, the, the year that we did the way we did uh, with the Broncos and getting into the finals was really special and then um, you know to, to get there to, to beat um, the Canterbury Bulldogs there in the semi-final to put ourselves in, in the grand final against Melbourne Storm we had a great belief that we could we could knock off the storm and 
you know, it was an amazing um, way to finish. And obviously Shane whipped his last game as a Bronco too. So it was really fitting in for him to finish as a grand final winner. It's phenomenal to think that the, the maroon effect flowed into the Broncos mm. because they were often one of the same, such a huge Bronco influence in the Queensland team. Obviously, you'd been through some, some lean years for Queensland, yeah. but that 2006, that was the start of everything. That was the beginning of the dynasty. What was the shift? What was the change that you noticed? I think there was just this, um, I guess, realisation around, you know, what does it take to, to win those big games and especially when you look at the talent on, on both sides but it's got to come from within it's got to come from from uh, i guess a a deeper sentiment about who was it that you represent who do you play for and i think you know at, at origin level you know um we had a real good connection we went out to um some of the communities that were really hit hard um with um uh, with the drought and and floods um, at that time, um, I remember being out in Roma and uh, we walked down the main street and, and I know families had driven, you know, three, four or five hours to, to see us walk down that main street. And it was a really special moment. And um, when we got back on the bus, um, Mal said on Wednesday night, when you cross the line, that's who you play for, never forget that. And uh, I think that really inspired us. And I think just that mentality sort of helped us go to another level. I think, um, you know, for us, it gave us a great sense of belief. But, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, what's your, um, what's your point of difference as a group? Well, I think that was our, for us, like that connection to a people who you represent. Um, and that sort of drove us right through to, to the grand final. I think just those thoughts of, you know, especially being at the end of my career, thinking, well, who am I playing this for? And obviously family in the, in the crowd and our, our supporters that hadn't seen a title win for a few, a few years. So it was really special to get it done. Your returns, your carries, I think, are the most explosive and powerful that we've ever seen in the game. What drove you in those moments? Yeah, I think that sense of responsibility to the team. Um, you know, you've got a job to do, and as a front rower, there's, there's nowhere to hide. And uh, you know you've got a, a role to play as a front rower. That it, it, it's on your shoulders, you know, with, um, you know to, to, to get that momentum that you need as a team. So, you know, often there's times where you start to question, you know, yourself and, and that you, you're tired. Um, uh, but you just got to keep pushing, you know, and um, and I think that sense of responsibility was something that, you know, definitely spurred me on. And, um, you know, when you've got guys like Darren Lockie in the back, uh, you know, and obviously at origin level, you know, uh, Billy Slater and uh, and Lockie and, and Cameron Smith were relying on you, um, you, you feel that and you don't want to let them down. And I think that's something that sort of carried me throughout my career. Bowen and Sivan Asiva getting it together. Sivan Asiva's over! The big fella! You make it sound so gentlemanly that that's my <laughs> job and I'm going to go out and do it to the best of my ability. But it got it, it's physical. It gets willing. It's bloodthirsty. Mm. It can descend really quickly. How mm. did you keep yourself out of too much drama when really mm. you see people overcook it and they lose all sense of reality and it becomes really brutal and, and becomes a, almost like an assault? Yeah. Well, it was actually a lesson learned really early on my Broncos career. I, I actually got sent off in a reserve grade game uh, for, uh, yeah, uh, I guess going beyond the rules and uh, I think I uh, got in a bit of a fight and um, had a good chat to Wayne after the match and um, he just said, look, you know, you're wasting your time if, if you think that's how you're going to, you know, beat your opponent. Um, it's got to be in your carries and the way you hit, you know, um, defensively, you know. That's how you earn their respect and, and I think I took a lot out of that. So that sort of carried me throughout my whole career is just understanding that. And so all I did was just try to play as physical as possible and, um, you know, didn't have great speed, didn't have great agility, but I knew I could do that for the team. Um, that's something that I took a lot of pride in. And again, it's all about not wanting to let your mates down and, um, you know, just be there for them. And I was really lucky to partner with some, some amazing front rowers in my time. The blokes that you played against, the first thing they'll say is he never gave up and his first hit was as hard as his last hit. <laughs> it's not like you ever had fatigue. Where did that energy and desire and drive come from? A bit old school, I think, you know, you're taught as a front rower is that you need to get on top of your opposition front rower. So that was always my mindset, you know, is that, you know, there's a battle that's going to happen and it's obviously, you know, team versus team, but in the middle, it's pack versus pack and, and front row versus front rower. So it's about winning that, that battle, you know, and um, and I think that was always, you know, uh, in my mindset was that I, I needed to, to get on top of my opposition front rower. Anyone mad enough to try and take you on? Oh, there was plenty, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, there was plenty. Oh, it's hard to pinpoint anyone. I had, you know, huge respect for someone like a Ruben Wiki who I remember as a young young kid, um, I was a bit of a Raiders fan, so 
seeing Ruben in those early days and then to see him, you know, work his way into the pack and he was someone that, you know, you, you had a lot of respect for. And By the time you moved to the Panthers, you've got this big presence, you're, you're a natural leader, you're captain. What are your responsibilities for the Panthers who are going through some challenges of their own through those seasons? Yeah, it was a uh, it was a big move for, for myself and the family. And um, I, I, as as we mentioned there before, I mean, when I arrived, I, you could just see that the pride in, in, in the Panthers jersey. And I, I didn't want to be a player, especially as I was at the end of my career. I didn't want to be a guy that was turning up to, to the Panthers and, you know, the fans were disappointed with the way I played and questions would be asked about, you know, what were my motives? Was it to be down here for a paycheck or... So I, I just felt like I needed to show the fans that, you know, I was willing to give whatever it took to, to, to wear the jersey proudly and to represent them uh, in, the, in the Penrith community. Um, it was a bit of a tough one in that, yeah, it was some challenging times for the Panthers at the time and Matt Elliott was the head coach and... He, I just felt so fortunate. He gave me an opportunity to come down there. Um, but I guess being handed the captaincy was a bit of a surprise and that, you know, I thought there were senior players there that probably deserved it over me. But I think collectively as a group, um, you know, we had to turn things around. So I was very lucky. I had some great senior players around me. Um, you know, I had Trent Wardhouse, Luke Lewis, the Pool Tour brothers. Um, so some great leaders within that team. Gav Cooper came as well. And, I think together, you know, we, we tried to form a really good leadership group and, you know, tried to turn things around for the Panthers. How do the cultures compare between the two clubs? You come from the bright, shiny, you mm. know, mega successful Broncos <laughs> and to the Panthers who were in a rebuilding phase. Mm. What was the culture difference between the two? There was actually the similarities between very, very proud communities and that's that's what I felt. I felt a real sense of, of that, you know, when I first arrived. I guess there's weight of expectation as well too, you know, as I said, proud communities in both both places, but um, they all demand, you know, success. You got a chance for the, the perfect homecoming mm. uh, to bring up your 300 game milestone back as a Brisbane Bronco. Did that feel right? Yeah, it was, it was a wonderful way and I, I actually thought I'd be finishing my career down in Penrith, but the way things had happened, I think Phil Gould arrived at the club and sort of spoke about sort of some of the changes that he needed to make to the roster. And I think I made the decision pretty easy for him. And um, in that, um, you know, I, I said to him, look, I, my wife and the kids, um, you know, be ready to go home now. So um, I was I had a phone call from Andrew G um, at the start of the year and had asked if I'd be keen to come back. And it was a quick yes. You know, to fi finish it off in a Broncos jersey where it all started was really special. Just on, on behalf of all the players and the staff and everyone here tonight, mate, we just want to thank you for what you've given this great team and this great state. You're the most capped forward, mate, in Origin history. And every time, mate, you've played your heart out. And we love you. Congratulations. Tell us a little bit about growing up and why rugby league was such a big presence in mm. in your household. Yeah, well, uh, I guess, you know, we came from Fiji. Um, I was only a few months old when mum and dad made the brave decision to come across as a young couple. Um, we settled in Redcliffe. Dad played rugby union for the Redcliffe uh, Rugby Club. So I had a great childhood. I'd, I'd followed and watched my dad's career unfold, you know, over a decade. and. Um, Dad had a pretty mean reputation, so uh, I had to try and follow in his footsteps. But yeah, it was it was wonderful sort of watching his, his rugby career. But uh, going to a state school, there was no uh, rugby union, so uh, league was the only code that was played. And uh, that transpired in me then joining up with the Redcliffe Dolphins as a young junior. And, um, you know, I think uh, uh, I was very lucky to, to go to such a great uh, club like the Dolphins. Um, that's where it really set me up for um, for senior footy. You mentioned your dad had a fearsome reputation. He had an almighty presence uh, in and around Brisbane Rugby Union. Were you scared of him? Was everyone else scared <laughs> of him? What what made him so such an enormous character? Yeah, big man in stature. I'm, I'm six foot two. I think dad was about six foot four. So uh, he was a big second rower. And um, yeah, look, I think it was just rugby league and rugby union back in those days. I mean, that was it was pretty physical, very uh, very violent at times, but. Um, you know, as a, as a young boy running the sand onto the field and, um, you know, watching Dad um, uh, go about his football career was, was fantastic, you know. And I was, uh, yeah, very much in awe of him and what he achieved in, in his career. But, you know, when I look back on it now, I'm extremely grateful for Mum and Dad, you know, because they made that decision to, to, to come to Brisbane as a young couple with me. And, um, you know, uh, everything that I've got in my life is, is based on that, uh, that decision to, to leave Fiji. So 
very grateful to them for what they've given me. Then how proud were they when they realised the trajectory of your career mm. and to see you then go through the grades and, and become a Hall of Famer? Mm. They must have thought, my God, we're, we've done such a good job here. We couldn't be more proud of the, the young man that we raised. Yeah, I think that's um, something that I'm, I'm uh, you know, I can look back on and be proud of because I think, you know, uh, for them, um, it is, uh, you know, it, it gives validation for that decision to leave Fiji. You know, um, I think playing State of Brides and then getting to play for Australia for the first time. And that was, a, you know, a funny one in that um, I'd actually been invited to play for Fiji in the 2000 World Cup, but because of my injury, I couldn't uh, couldn't go away on that side. I think Wayne had a quick, no, you're not playing. So couldn't do that. But, you know, it was 2001, the year, uh, year later, I, I was picked to play for, for Australia with the Kangaroos. So, you know, talking to mum and dad about it, I mean, they, they said, look, doesn't matter, you're playing for Australia, you're representing Fiji at the same time too. So I think hearing that from them uh, made it even sweeter. So um, that's why, you know, wearing that kangaroos jersey meant so much to me. I've heard you say that, that even though you were in the green and gold of Australia, you still felt like you were representing the kangaroos and the Fiji inside of your heritage and your family and your culture and your history. That Did that empower you rather than feel divided or feel like I should loyally mm. pick, you know, where mum and dad are from where you were born? You know, for me, uh, just their validation from them was, was all I needed, really, because, um, you know, and, and I, I got a, a sense of that. And every time we'd go back to Fiji and, you know, could just see the looks on you know, families' faces, you know, for the season that I've had, you know, that you could just see what it meant to them. So, um, and it's funny how it goes full circle, you know, it's, um, you know, getting a chance to play for Fiji in the 2013 World Cup right at the very last year of my career has now led me to this journey now doing um, a lot of you know work in, in Fiji with our development pathway uh, program, the, the Kaiviti Siltals. And um, it's been a, a bit of a passion piece uh, for myself and uh, Steve Driscoll, who, uh, who helps me with that as well too. Uh, it's done an amazing job and we're uh, four years into that program now and um, you know hopefully can unearth some future NRL stars from Fiji. The Siltars is so exciting for the pathways, the growth. What what would be your dream? We'd love to see, um, you know, uh, an NRL franchise come from the Pacific one day. Um, could it be Fiji? I'm not too sure, but I think we're we're taking the right steps to do that. Um, you know, we've got a great development pathway with the Fiji Rugby League. who have got their schools programs as well. But um, yeah, it's just amazing to sort of see, you know, how quickly it's growing. Um, we've got so much talent over there that um, I think, you know, certainly would be well suited to, to playing rugby league. And, um, you know, it's, it's such a big part of the culture. Why is the game so much stronger with the rise of the Pacifica? I just think you look at the representation of Pacifica players in the game right now, um, and I think uh, there's just a, a wonderful opportunity to grow the game. Um, and I know that we're only really scratching the surface, and um, I think, uh, you know, when you look at so, test football level, PNG have been playing great footy, Samoa, Tonga uh, have been fantastic, and you've seen the rise of, uh, of Tonga over the last few years. Um, there's, that's not discounting, you know, that other Pacific nations can't do the same. So I think the opportunity to be able to place players within the NRL or the second tier level of competition, I think, will, um, will all go really well towards um, a really strong international scene. By the time you represented Fiji on the international stage, what was the difference? How did you feel differently about yourself when you had the, the Barty emblem across your chest? Yeah, it was almost like completing the journey for me. You know, um, I was so proud to wear the, the kangaroos jersey. It was a jersey that I never wanted to give up. Um, I was always going into every preseason thinking some young front row is going to take that Queensland jersey or that or that uh, kangaroos jersey away from me. So that was always my mindset, you know, in, in being ready to play. And um, then finally, when when it come to um, you know, to putting on that Fijian jersey after I retired from rep footy in Australia, um, yeah, it was it was it was a wonderful way to sort of give back. I think you know um, to recognise my heritage, to learn a lot about my heritage, which I didn't really know a lot of. But, um, you know, that was the stepping stone for me to, to do the work that I'm doing currently. So I'm really, really grateful for, for playing for Fiji. And um, we had a great World Cup. We got to the semi-finals and, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, ran to a red-hot kangaroo side. But, you know, just to be in a Fiji Bati jersey playing uh, against a lot of my great mates that I played for the Kangaroos was, uh, was really special. It's a great way to go out. I think one of the most cherished scenes we have in international rugby league is when the Bati sing their hymn, mm. the Noku Masu. Yes. What makes that so powerful and what is it like to be part of that chorus? 
Yeah, I, I didn't really understand uh, a whole lot of, of uh, as I said, that Fijian culture, you know, going into my first Bati camp, but uh, it was a bit of a, a rude awakening. Uh, we went uh, straight into an army camp and um, we're not staying in a flash hotel like the kangaroos do. Uh, but uh, I, you know what, it was a, it was a really humbling uh, way to understand culture. Um, we uh, visited a few villages, we cooked for ourselves. Um, we, uh, as a group, before we had it off, it was, um, there was something special. It was um, that spirituality that uh, is so, um, so such a huge part of the Fijian culture. Uh, which was a wonderful way for us because 7 a.m. devotion, um, 7 a.m. in the kangaroo side, I think some of those, some of my teammates were getting home from uh, places where they shouldn't have been. But, uh, um, but yeah, to, to be a part of a Fiji inside that, that was such a big part of the makeup of the team w was, was, was beautiful. And you're remembered for so many wonderful moments in the game, a Hall of Famer. What do you think your legacy is in rugby league? Oh, I think someone that played uh, the game tough but fair. Um, you know, I, um, uh, Hopefully, you know, uh, led by example and, um, yeah, someone that was a good teammate, you know. I was always um, just big on not wanting to let your mates down and I think that was something that always was a part of me. Wayne Bennett said that you're in his grand final for one of the toughest men that he's ever coached and no one ever wanted to get tackled by you. <laughs> and I think that's such a beautiful testament to how you conducted yourself and held yourself. When you've got people like that saying things about you, mm. you must be so proud of your journey. Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, you remember when you first started out, you doubt yourself, you question, you know, whether you've got what it takes, but then it's through the course of the journey, through the ups and downs, you know, and, you know, the, the, the wonderful people that you meet along the journey that, you know, give you that confidence and, um, you know, give you that belief that you've got what it takes. And then, um, and then you know, it's just about playing your part and um, being a great teammate and, as I said, not letting anyone down. How does the great Petro Sivanasiva spend grand final day? Yeah, we'll be very nervous uh, come Sunday. Um, um, it, uh, it's always great. It, it just brings back so many wonderful memories. Um, I was very lucky that the, the times that I got to play in a grand final, we won, and just those memories of that nervousness of, of a morning, waking up and that bus ride into the ground and seeing the bright lights and the cameras on in the, in the car park as we, we enter the dressing rooms. Just that nervousness of sitting in the shed and just, you know, trying to, you know, uh, quieten your thoughts about what's about to unfold and, you know, again, just going through the process and um, and hopefully you're doing enough to, to, to be able to lift that trophy up um, after the 80 minutes is finished. What's your tip for Sunday? Yeah, look, it's got to be a Broncos victory. Um, I think what Kevy and the boys have been through uh, been a great consistent year. Um, I think they'll get the job done. Um, maybe on the back of Reese Walsh, who, who knows, but um, I think with that forward pack leading the way, the boys will get it done and I think it'll be a Broncos uh, victory by uh, six points. You might have to be in charge of Alfie Langer if they win the <laughs> Premiership. You're going to have to be the Alfie minder. Have you done that for many, many years I, through your career? I have done that many times and hopefully the, that video footage is all deleted, but uh, <laughs> no, it's always, always great fun. And Alfie, um, what a champion. And look, if anyone deserves it, it's, it's, it's Alfie. Um, he's been the absolute backbone of Broncos for, for many years. And to see him and his partner in crime, Kevy, uh, be able to lift that trophy up, it'd be very special. Petro, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to chat with you. Thanks, Bonnie. Cheers.